It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main rain. And I was uh, watching, even before her image came up, watching Gata. She's prowling here. I'm not sure what's going on. Something's something's she's prowling. She's prowling. I did something's hmm. bothering her this morning. I have no idea what that might be, but you know, Is it's she bo- looking for some breakfast. Um, oh, she's got that. She got her breakfast. <laughs> she's all, you know, before anybody else in the house gets anything, it's Gata's treat. That's the morning ah. treat, treat for Gata, you know. Um, she runs this place. That's the way it works uh, around here. So, uh, but maybe what she was concerned about was uh, depending on where, right, Dan Costa writes in, good frozen morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, hi, Rachel. Uh, hi, Zan. Hi, Mr. Jameson. Um, hi, Diana. Hi, Diana. You once and called that, oh, me a warm, frustrated old man. That's for Scott. So Diana asked about the opening song. Who does our opening song? Oh. Good Planets. Um, yeah, that is, uh, uh, okay, the group. All right, now I'm going to make sure I've got this guy's name right. Hold on, because... Uh, Planets, hard, I got a song. The song, the, okay, here, it, it, there's a story. Hey, behind. good morning, Amos. Good morning, Snappy J. Uh, all the folks watching okay. us, we appreciate it. Here's a story. That show, that song was recorded live at Gargantua Radio down the dial uh, when I worked uh, the overnights at Gargantua Radio. Some people know it as WGN. And... Um, that was, I was filling in for Steve and Johnny on the overnights. Mm-hmm. Kathleen was with me. We brought in a group called the Hillbilly Winos. No kidding. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, uh, wait. they need, they get a ding. Okay. <laughs> the, yep. That's exactly, uh, their, their name is the uh, Hillbilly Winos. Shut up, Wesley. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I had seen them. I knew about them from a, a friend who said, you got to see this group. All right. And so Kathleen and I went to a near South side to a, a little dive down there and saw them play. And they did this song called uh-huh. good planets are hard to find. I said, first of all, these guys are going to be on the show on the overnight. I'm, and I'm going to have them come in and I'm going to have them play um, whatever they want. And they did this. I said, but you have to play good planets are hard to find. Uh, it turns out that song is written by a ge- guy named Steve Forbear, or maybe it's Forbert. Uh, I don't know exactly how that's pronounced. Depends where you live. I guess. But he's the author uh, uh, of the song. The uh, And um, uh, they came in the studio and live, when you hear that at the beginning of our show here, that was performed live and I was recording it. Uh, Steve King used to do that a lot at WGN on the overnights. He'd bring in a band and then he'd just set up the equipment, put a little reverb in there and just record it. And then he'd save the tape. And, uh, when we had tape and, uh, uh, and I did, uh, that. And so, which is why I, I can play that song. You know, if Steve Forbear ever finds me, uh, he might, he, <laughs> he might want something out of it. Uh, well, and there's I, another version on YouTube though. And you don't play the YouTube version. 
well, this is a two. This is I play a version that nobody has right. except me. Uh, so someday, um, I should play the whole song. I should just play uh, the whole song, and maybe I'll do that because I, I I can do that here. And as far as I know, there are no royalties attached, not yet. Anyway, not until uh, Steve Forbear finds me. Shh, be very very quiet. Okay, so, so that's Great. the story so of the, the song. Story. And the We're all done here, folks. Good to see you. That's it. That's all we got. <laughs> Good night, folks. Um, uh, and uh, if, for those of you who are in the Midwest, you know that it is freaking cold here. Scott this. says it's minus nine in Action Heights, a.k.a. Arlington Heights. It's a beautiful <laughs> sun. Ah, ah, Action <laughs> Heights. I like that. That's Allison hilarious. Allison says, good morning from Frozen Grays Lake. Uh, Connie, Connie Golden says, Kiki, the Norwegian forest cat, is listening. <laughs> we you need know, all the listeners we can get, folks. You, you know, I, I tell you, tell your, your friends and your friends' cats to uh, tune in to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, curse myself here and curse us because <laughs> the last few weeks we've had uh, some really uh, good response to the show, and I, you know, it's a new year. It's a new deal. Things, you know, and again, I'm going to curse myself, but you know what? I don't care. I'll, I'll throw it out there to the universe to mess with me, but uh, things have been going pretty smoothly. In fact, our first guest knows that uh, he knows what it's like when, when things do not work well on this program because, uh, well, we'll talk to him in just He's a second. He's been caught in the swirling vortex, he, he, yes. He, uh, he has. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny, but uh, and, and his name is Skeet from uh, Bartlett Tree Experts, uh, which, as you know, is the primary sponsor of the Mike Novak Show mm -hmm. with Peggy Malecki, and we couldn't be happier about that, and we are so grateful to them uh, for their sponsorship of the show and helping us uh, – uh, keeping this Nancy Bender. Hi, Nancy. How you doing? Um, hey, Deb. Good morning. Um, and uh, so Skeet's with us today because it's winter and we've talked about, oh, it's winter and your trees, you need to take care of it. And of course, it, it's been rainy and warm and who cares? And now suddenly <laughs> we've got 20 inches of snow and uh, or 15. Yeah. Some, or, someone washed their car and cursed the whole thing. And now we've got. And yeah. it's minus <laughs> nine there in Action Heights. And it's and my back porch says plus four, but I don't trust the thermometer on my back porch. Uh, but the official. I I saw the official was minus four um, uh, a few so minutes minus ago. Minus 10 on my phone this morning when uh, I got up. But the world whatever it is, I haven't seen Basil move out the door and back in that fast in a while. That There you go. <laughs> There's That tells you what it's like. So we're talking about winter tree care uh, today with uh, the folks from Bartlett Tree Experts, actually, Skeet. Uh, and we'll get to him in a second. But I also want to tell you, while we're on the subject of cold and snow and ice uh, in the at 10 o'clock. It's going to be very interesting because we're bringing in a guy uh, who knows something about de-icing. His name is Mitch Vestal, and he's the president of PlaySafe, uh, and uh, they are a, a company that uh, is trying to do it smart, safely, okay? Uh, we're... They are, uh, they've got a product that doesn't use sodium chloride. And you know what you do at this time of year. You go out and you get your rock salt. Well, that's not exactly uh, the best thing for the environment. It's certainly not good for your pets. Um, and uh, I know it's cheap, and that's why everybody buys it. But we're going to talk to Mitch about why that might not be such a good idea and what you can do as an alternative um, so, uh, play safe ice blocker is one of the places you can go and you can find that link at Mike Go to this week's blog. Uh, and again, uh, folks who are listening right now, uh, you can watch us on our website, Mike Novak.net, M I K E N O W A K.net. Uh, go to Facebook. You can go to Twitter, uh, a thing called Periscope on Twitter. Um, and, um, and of course, YouTube, the YouTubes, or used tubes. Used uh -oh. tubes. Yeah. Uh, so with that said, let's go to the aforementioned Skeet, uh, who's uh, right there. And in real time, this time, Skeet, uh, you're not... <laughs> 
<laughs> you're not five minutes behind everything. You're looking a little sinister there with the light from below, but that's okay because he's hunkered down at his desk in, in his office. How you doing, Skeet? Good morning, everybody. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, my goodness. I forgot all about that. That's, I uh, guess. A, a what? Yeah, really. Is that going on? Okay. Whatever. Um, I figured that you'd be out working on trees on, on, on a Sunday afternoon, Skeet. Uh, I, I am through the media of the Mike Nowak show. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, and, of course, our, our buddy Skeet is a, uh, a certified arborist. Uh, he is uh, an ISA, International Society of Arboriculture or arboriculture. You know what, Skeet? Um, you can type sure. in arborist and uh, word does not seem to understand. Uh, even WordPress do not seem to understand that that's a real word. I don't know why that is. Scott Jameson, uh, maybe you should tell us why uh, these various uh, programs don't seem to understand that arborist is a real word and has been a real word for some time. <laughs> Uh, I don't if get Scott's it. That's got the answer to that one. Uh, who knows? But uh, Skeet, you uh, you told me that you're a busy guy because uh, you uh, are in charge of what three crews that are that are uh, out there doing work for your clients. At, at this point, yes, we are very, very, very fortunate. Uh, we want to thank all of our clients, thank all of our crew members. Uh, it's been an exciting winter. Um, I'll bet. Many clients have uh, grasped on the idea that winter is a tree care season. And it's a wonderful season to prune and take care of trees. And uh, right now, we are fortunate to have the amount of work. We've got a crew up visiting us from our Indianapolis office. And we were talking about uh, ladies and women in arbor culture. Morgan from our Indianapolis office is uh, visiting us and working for a couple weeks and Scott and um, Austin they're all from our Indianapolis office from down south coming up here to help us um, as we've got uh, plenty of work to, to keep them busy well you know so, we talked about that last year at the beginning of uh, the pandemic uh, you guys like other oh there's basil by the way basil's very excited this morning Peggy <laughs> <laughs> um, the, Obviously, the cold weather's not keeping some some uh, truck with prime going from. from oh going yeah, the, the prime truck. And if you're lucky, the stuck the truck will get stuck, and Basil will bark for two hours now. Um, <laughs> uh, Skeet, last year we talked about how we weren't sure what was going to happen, and it, all people in all uh, aspects of horticulture were tiptoeing around trying to figure out what was going to happen. But it sounds like, uh, in terms of tree care, things got kind of back to normal rather quickly i'm given and we've run your ads with this and by the way as i mentioned they're a, a great sponsor of the mike novak show with peggy malecki bartlett tree experts um but we ran ads about how you were doing things at a distance with masks and safe and you're still you're still doing that but i would imagine aside from that things are kind of normal aren't they we're, we're very fortunate mike you're right um you know, at, at a certain point, you need to smile and, and say our, our social distance is elevated. We're, we're about 30 feet in the air, 40 feet. <laughs> taking care of so uh, we, we where's, have, where's that rim shot when we need it? Oh, wait, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. It'll be late, but it's it's there someplace. Go ahead, Skeet. Well, thank you. So our, our <laughs> there it is. It's up above and and uh, side to side. And, and so we're, we're very fortunate. Um, our, our crews are doing a, a tremendous job. Again, huge thanks to our clients. And when, when people are home and people create a timeout in life with COVID, they really appreciate the outdoors. They appreciate their trees. They appreciate their landscape. And, and that's their safe zone. That's their bubble to, to mm -hmm. live with. Yeah. And want to create that as a positive environment. And, and that's what we're here to do. We're, we're here to help them create that positive environment. And if that means we need to care for their trees by pruning a tree or removing a tree that's not uh, safe for, for themselves anymore or special care that needs to go into a, a pest management fertilization program, um, even lightning protection. 
you know, people are spending time outside and they want to have their, their certain trees protected um, in lieu of uh, lightning. We not can, a, not can... only lightning, but, but, but storm damage of other kind. The last time you were on, um, we had just gone through the derecho that came through the Chicago area, and that created a lot of havoc, didn't it? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, and it, it creates havoc, and yet you, you see the benefit of tree care, too because our clients that had tree care did not have those issues. And so um, it's just another reminder that preventative maintenance goes a long way. And in positive tree care and having a certified arborist uh, working with you to create a plan for your property is long-term the way to go to take care of these are large living assets. And, and how are we gonna take care of these assets? What are your priorities? What are your needs? Where do you spend time outside? How do you want your trees to look? These are all questions that our certified arborist will work with you to create these plans. And something you just alluded to was a sense of normalcy uh, in uh, a pandemic when life is so hard. One of the normal things you can do is take care of your trees and then your trees uh, in return give you comfort and security. Uh, so you can still reach out to a company like uh, Bartlett. And let me tell you, folks, again, I'm, I'm going to say you should really talk to a certified arborist to come and look at your trees. Your trees are a valuable asset. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, give them a holler and, and have them come and because they know they can give you a plan. Um, uh, something, Pe uh, Peggy, you were talking about uh, earlier is uh, getting a plan uh, for uh, 2021. Um, yeah, uh, a tree and shrub plan. Yeah, and that's something else that uh, uh, folks can do with a with a tree care company, right, Skeet? Absolutely. Uh, and you know, and, you know, right now this is dormant season, so it is a season mm -hmm. for tree care. And if there's oaks and elms, now is the time that oaks and elms need to be pruned. You mentioned why, uh, why is that, Skate? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, and um, thank you, Peggy. And, and some municipalities have some ordinances that that's the only time you can work on oaks and elms. Um, oak trees are susceptible to oak wilt, and elm trees are susceptible to Dutch elm disease. Both vectors are carried by beetles, and this time of the year, there's no beetle activity. It is cold outside. And so now is the time to prune oaks and elms. I, I was going to, you mentioned that, but you meant when you wrote to me earlier this week, you mentioned one other tree in that list, oaks, elms, and hawthorn. hawthorn. Tree. Yeah. Yeah. Hawthorn trees a lot of times have big old nasty thorns on them. And in the wintertime, we tend to have a couple extra layers of clothes on. <laughs> and, well, um, and, and in the thorns, people may not know, in the th on the thorns, there is a little fungus at the tip of those thorns. And if that punctures and that breaks inside your skin, that does create an emergency room situation because mm. that can't grow. And so, unfortunately, it has happened to people, and they wake up in the morning with your hand looking like the size of a softball and say, gee whiz, what wow. happened? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And so Hawthorne trees with leather gloves uh, in the wintertime, uh, you know, again, with Safety above all else. That is the Bartlett philosophy. That is our standard, standard, standard. Safety above all else. And if we're going to minimize and, and try to reduce risks, then Hawthorns are the are wintertime type activity. See, I had no idea. So this is this is something new for me. Uh, so Hawthorne uh, is, is a matter of safety for you. Uh, yeah. The Oaks and Elms is a matter of safety for the tree. Um, yeah. Because, uh, and and uh, as you say, a lot of municipalities will say you cannot prune them, what is it, between April and October? Generally, the time frame, yes, is April to October. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those that's uh, a, a sliding scale depending on the, where you are from southern Illinois to northern Illinois. Right. Um, in general, um, you know, around April 15th would be an approximate cut off date okay all right so here we are it's winter as you said uh this is a great time to prune trees and and there are some uh 
um, easy ways to understand that. One is uh, the leaves are gone on deciduous trees, so you can see the shape better. So that that works that way. The other thing is when the ground's frozen, um, you can move in equipment, and it's not going to mess up the garden around a tree uh, or, or your lawn. Uh, another reason why you want to uh, do work in the winter. But what happens, Skeet? <laughs> when yes. you get when you get 15 inches of snow and then yeah. after you get the 15 inches of snow you get minus nine uh degrees temperature how does that affect the work you're doing uh it gets real exciting and interesting really <laughs> we uh we say kudos to our clients for their patience as we set a date and then mother nature gives us a swing uh, ultimately, it's up to Mother Nature when we're going to be out on clients' properties. And and so, we again, huge kudos. Thank you to our clients. And, and uh, you know, and they really appreciate the crews, too. I mean, but but what, about, what, what are the practical, I know they do, but the, the practical considerations of getting to a tree when there's 15 inches of snow on the ground, what, what are you dealing with? Obviously, some, I would imagine one of the things is just getting the trucks in there and not getting them stuck. Um and, and, and the other is, how, how does uh, 15 inches of snow affect your ability to get up into a tree and look at the, the situation? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we need to be very selective of what jobs we're on. Again, safety above all else. Uh, I, I shared with you a few pictures of my excitement this week. And uh, but we, we selected jobs where we're not in backyards. The trees are all in the front yard. So we're not wearing out our crews, dragging brush from backyard to front yard. So we're going to be selective. Um, you're right. We're, we're going to keep our trucks on the roads. And so we're not going to be driving in the backyards. That's just not something we do um, without um, precautions as plywood being placed down and, and some other um, information given to the client and getting client permission. So thank you. There's, there's a job site we're working on this week where all the trees are right off the road. Um, we've got our, our signs up um, ahead of time before this long row of cones. And so we've got this long row of uh, blaze maple trees that need to be pruned. And so this is perfect. We've saved this job for dormant season. We've saved it for the fact that we can get to it very easily off the road. We're gonna have less disturbance to people coming up and down the sidewalk. We can prune these trees, seeing the structure of the trees, and we save this for a snowy day because it's not going to be as damaging or harmful or or wear out our crews dragging brush from front yard to from backyard to front yard. So again, safety above all else. I, I, I that's a really good point. Is that it's it's a lot harder to drag out the material if uh, if if you've got snow in the way. And uh, this looks. Uh, I was going to show these. Uh, uh, after the break, but that's okay. I I'll pop them up there now. In fact, uh, here's here's another one you sent me. They look like something out of the old Batman series. Uh, there's nothing. Everything everything is uh, is is kind of uh, tilted there. A skew. A skew. Yeah, and uh, that would be uh, crew photography from crew members. <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> if, if if you took that or if or if one of the other crew members did, but. Uh, the thing you said also was you wait until this time of year to get to certain trees. So do you tell your client, Hey, that tree's in front. It's going to be easier for us to do that in the winter. Can you hang on till then? Uh, is that something that you would say to a client? Absolutely. We say, what are your expectations? What are your time frames? How would your tree like to look? What are your thoughts on possibly doing this work in the winter time to be less disruptive because we're going to be working for this association and in all these backyards and our trucks are noisy. Chippers are noisy. Windows are shut in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. We're going to be blocking off a sidewalk. This is a very pedestrian uh, jogging, walking. This is a very active community. So I'm thinking we're going to best suit your needs and be less disruptive to your association, to your, to our clients um, be in the middle of winter. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, and they were, they were excited. This is a three-year plan, and the first two years went very, very smooth. Mm -hmm. And so um, on the third year here, 
they're they're comfortable. They they appreciate what we've been doing. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so that those are parts of the consideration that you know you've got those trucks there and you're trying to direct traffic around. One of the things you talked to me about the other day was um, dressing your workers for the yeah. cold. You you sent me a link to uh, heated vests and heated gloves, and I'm yeah. I'm such a dope because uh, I, I don't could use those heated gloves myself. Oh, I had oh. no idea there was such a thing that you can plug in a glove and mm-hmm. heat it up or a vest. Well, of course you're nodding. You would know. I don't know any of them. Well, the vests, yeah. Uh, well, they're At gloves least. too, right, Skeet? There's gloves, there's socks, there's, there's, there's boots. Uh, and, and so, again, safety above all else, our clients and our crews and our crews are, are valuable teammates. These are, these are teammates. These, these crew members are just aces, and, and they love to take mm-hmm. care of trees, and, and it's just the right thing to do to take care of our crews. Um, you saw that big job site. Um, we had 12 people out there. I stopped out there at 1030 and brought out the Dunkin' Donuts, big box of Joe, <laughs> big box of hot chocolate. And we all did a little safety time out at 1030 and said, how, how are we doing? You know, are, are we, are we safe? We got our job site set up. Are you warm? You guys okay? What, what, what do you need? Um, and, and just took a little, uh, take three, took a little time out and, uh, got some hot chocolate and, and got some comfort. Well, with that being said, yes, outfitting well, the crews and, and working with the crews on what is layering, what is warm clothes, um, the, the heated vest for the crews, uh, what, what do you need to do your job safely? We're going to provide that. We're going to help you out with that. Absolutely. Well, I guess that, that keeps you, we're going to be breaking here in a second, but that keeps you a little busier because you're the 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 supervisor and now you've got three crews and you got to make sure that all three are dressed properly and that the the snow is not getting in the way and that they've got traffic blocked off properly yes. i imagine you have to coordinate that with municipalities as well and, and the association yes it um it, it gets to be a little exciting and, <laughs> and that's what you got to do to, to get it done correctly and safely uh and, you know and, and you know and that job site we, we had a client come out and bring the crew pizza because we did such a great job and we're, we're taking care of the trees close to his fence and he was worried about his fence and damage. He brought the crew pizza last year. I mean, I mean, the class act that one. Yeah. Um, so that's the respect that our crews have for clients and clients have for our crew. Well, I would imagine, yeah, that if, if, if they want you to do the, the – if they like what you're doing – you know, you're going to get some people who are, who are friendly. Uh, I don't even want to talk about the people who are not friendly uh, when when you're out there uh, working on trees. Uh, that is Skeet, by the way, uh, certified arbors from Bartlett Tree Experts. Uh, we need to take uh, a short break. And uh, when we come back, I want to show more uh, photos that you sent me and some of the uh, – uh, the things that you guys are dealing with, one, one, one in particular is, well, there's a couple that are kind yeah. of entertaining uh, that I think uh, you'll enjoy. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Molecki. Uh, send us your questions, if you have any tree care questions uh, for right now. We'd be happy to take them and, and put Skeet on the spot. Uh, and, uh, I'm sure that, uh, uh, you know, if stump the skeet is a, is a program we can do as regularly as possible. So <laughs> hang in there. We'll, all right, we'll be right back. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collective Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. My name is Megan Kosensky and I'm a plant health care specialist and a grounds person at Bartlett Tree Experts. It's no secret that the world of arboriculture is a male-dominated industry, but there is a fearless group of women out there that are determined to change that and I'm really proud to be one of those women. 
Bartlett has been really great about recognizing any kind of roadblocks for different genders, different races, people of different nationalities, and just kind of taking a bulldozer to all of those roadblocks. Every day that I go to work, I find something new that I love about what I do. Every tree needs a champion. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. From small boat fishermen to your dinner table with safe, free, no-contact delivery, Sitka Salmon Shares brings premium wild Alaska seafood to your door. They're a community-supported fishery offering shares just like your local CSA. All fish is wild caught in season with respect for the limits of the ocean. Line caught and traceable to their fleet. Use promo code NOVAK25 for $25 off the first month of a share. Go to SitkaSalmonShares.com slash N-O-W-A-K. And then, of course, my audio didn't go on, and uh, Peggy's audio didn't go on. And then Peggy says, Not even a worldwide pandemic can stop the One Earth Film Festival, especially in its 10th anniversary season. The Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki is proud to have been part of 10 years of inspiring change. And once again, the event is online this year. And over the next few weeks, we'll be showing you trailers of some of the great films that will be presented this year in the festival. So we start with Gather, the fight to revitalize our native foodways. Our ancestors saw the world end once. That whole life was gone. Now we're on the other side of the apocalypse. The different wrongs that have been done to native peoples are just so sickening. I mean, they even had slogans like, kill the Indian, save the man. That's genocide. Millions of people all across the Americas systematically wiped out, starting here on the East Coast. That's the reason that we don't have that relationship with some of those traditional foods anymore. What's popping? I see onions. Yeah, we have uh, red onions, yellow onions. Matcha, covered squash. You ready? We're salmon people. But what do we do if our salmon don't come back? What I've come to understand is if we want to maintain our culture, then we have to have buffalo as a vital part of our communities. What we're doing is reintroducing our young people to the land, the food, and our traditional ways of healing. Working at the farm has brought a lot of healing to my life. I've been clean 16 years, June now. I learned to heal through harvesting our traditional food. We're celebrating Apache Foodways in a kitchen that was built by Apaches for Apaches. It's this movement among all indigenous people that they're finally, they're listening. And it's like music. When you hear the drum, it's calling you. And it's Mother Earth. And Mother Earth's heart's beating. And she's talking to all of us that we need to do something. It's inside first, I think. Before there was corn, I had to get this. The One Earth Film Festival runs from March 5th through 14th with the 2021 season launch party on Friday, March 5th at 6.30 p.m. Unless otherwise indicated, all films are free with a suggested $8 donation. For more information, go to oneearthfilmfest.org, and uh, we're very excited that we're going to be able to mm -hmm. uh, bring you more uh, of those trailers uh, in, in the coming weeks, and we hope that you can participate online with the One Earth Film Festival. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We are talking trees this morning with Skeet from Bartlett Tree Experts. Uh, 
couple of things, um, Skeet. And we have a question from Connie, too. Oh, okay. Let's let's go to the question, and then I'll get back to uh, the other things I was going to say. Okay. So Connie says, Skeet, we had to cut down a green ash in the terrace, got it down to 30 inches, leaving the trunk to be the base of a little library box. But how to kill the trunk? Lots of growth coming off of it. The city made it come down to uh, EAB, so it's infected but not dead. Got it. Um, well, we've got a 100% root system. We've got a little bit of a top. That tree, the fence mech, the trees, uh, growth is going to want to grow. And so it's going to mm -hmm. keep stuffing up or keep growing. Um, all you can do is keep clipping those sprouts out, and that, that's all you can do. Um, I would not recommend any herbicide, insecticide, anything like that, chemical-wise. Um, all you can do is just keep clipping all the new growth out, and eventually that will slowly suffocate and kill the root system. Yeah, eventually it runs out of energy. It's, it's funny uh, that uh, they should bring that up because down my block on um, uh, on the other side, on the parkway, I don't know why they did this. Uh, a number of years ago, somebody planted a cottonwood in the parkway. Of all places. Why, all right? why not? Well, I know. <laughs> and then every year, they cut it back down to like two feet. And of course, then all of the branches come up during the season. And at the end of the season, they cut it back again. So now you've got this trunk that's this wide around. And every year, the, it comes back. And every year, they cut it back. There's, there's no end game to this. I have no idea what it is that they're trying to do, but they're, what they're doing is thwarting. A cottonwood wants to grow. It wants to send out branches. It wants to be a tree. It's not going to be a shrub, no matter how hard you prune it. It's just not going to be a shrub. A I, shrub. I, and, I'm, and I'm sure you've seen stuff like this before, Skeet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, wrong tree, wrong spot. And then it becomes a frustration. It's not a joy anymore for, for anybody. And all those coppice sprouts or sucker sprouts that are coming out are weak attachments. Um, and they're very storm susceptible. And so um, that that's the ongoing frustration. And it's going to take some education and some leadership. Yeah. And, and I, I, at this point, there's nothing you can do except, as you say, with Connie, is that you have to cut off every single branch. I have some junk trees, and I use that phrase uh, uh, advisedly, uh, by my fence. And I know that what you have to do is if they pop up in the spring and you're cutting them back, you get, every time a leaf pops up, you got to cut that. you got to just starve mm -hmm. it for energy. You can't, it can't allow it to manufacture energy through leaves at all, ever. Um, yeah. And that's how you get rid of of those trees eventually they give up and they and and they die but that can be uh, a long time can it skeet absolutely we're talking about stored carbohydrates and sugars mm -hmm. in the root system and even in those coppice sprouting there is some photosynthate in this in the in the sprouts not only in the leaves so it's just a matter of keeping it clipped and keeping it clipped and that's that's uh you know if you're out there mowing and gardening once a week you said that to the list of things to do. All right. I have to read something that uh, <laughs> Scott Jameson, who is the vice president at Bartlett, and uh, uh, he, he... Give Scott a ding. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and, of course, uh, is a great guy and, and a good arborist. Um, and he wrote this, and I had no idea. This is really interesting. Um, it doesn't really bear a lot to uh, our conversation here, but it is interesting. He says, our trade association for decades was the National Arborist Association. I think he's writing about when I was talking about the word arborist, okay? So the Nash, for decades, it was the National Arborist Association. The National Association office would regularly get bomb and death threats from pro-life activists. We changed the name to the Tree Care Industry Association. The death threats stopped. Wow. Okay, folks, the word is arborist. Okay, it's a very different word. Just because it has an A and a B in it, it's not the other word you're thinking of. That's, that's really interesting. The other thing I wanted to bring up was 
uh, during the break, we showed the spot with uh, the women of uh, mm-hmm. Bartlett Tree Experts. Uh, and as you say, Scott, uh, Skeet, rather, Scott and Skeet, it's the Scott and Skeet show. Um, you have uh, dealt with women, and more and more women are getting into the industry, aren't they? Yeah, we're, we're very proud. It, it's, uh, if anybody wants to help and take care of trees, they're a welcomed employee. And, and so huge kudos to Bartlett Tree Experts. Pre-COVID had a Women in Arbor Culture uh, annual program where they went to the Bartlett Labs. And if I remember, Mike, you've been to the Bartlett Labs. Yep. We are mm-hmm. so fortunate yep. to have some world-class doctors doing incredible research at the, at the lab down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And recently, we um, now have an adjunct at the Martin Arboretum. And we've got Dr. Chad Rigsby, who's been on the show. And uh, Dr. Chad is uh, right with Bartlett Tree Experts out of the Morton Arboretum. And so we've got this great relationship and and our business is scientific tree care. And that comes from research and it comes from working in conjunction with the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Botanic Garden, two um, allies working with us on professional tree care. And so... It doesn't sure. matter if 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 you're uh, if you're a boy or a girl, you can work on trees. You can climb trees there. So uh, that's something. Climb trees, take care of trees. You can do all different tree care. We from um, pest management, fertilization um, to yeah, lab work. Lab work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know you they uh, you you mentioned the uh, uh, the Bartlett uh, Research Labs in North Carolina. And yes, Peggy and I went down there a couple of years. It's now two years. Um, yeah. and it was a great trip in March. And when things were, it was all snow here and it was, things were blooming down there. Magnolias and, were blooming and dogwoods were blooming and it was amazing. And I saw the photo. Uh, if you see the photo in that commercial of the women standing in front mm-hmm. uh, and I went, I've been there. Yeah. I, I was looking at, uh, I, like, I know that place. Yeah. So that was cool. All right, I want we to show... A, we have another question that came in, too. All right, great. Let's take a question. Um, this is actually coming off of YouTube, I think. Um, what to replace our 130-year-old hackberry with? A storm took it out. Wow. You know, th- these, these are great questions, and the best answer to these type questions is to call Bartlett Tree Experts, Certified Arborists, and let's take a look at the site together. It's just, it's just not fair for me to say, oh, put a Baroque in. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen the site. I haven't yeah. seen. What, what are the what considerations that? on the site, Ski? What's that? What would the considerations be that you'd be looking at? Size, place, soil type, um, expectations, spring flower, fall color. How are you going to use the tree? Screening. Uh, what, what do you want to get out of this tree? Um, to replace the tree. And uh, while we're there, we can take a look at the other trees, shrubs. Um, mm-hmm. you, know, you, you may have a yard full of oak trees, and here I am recommending an oak tree and yeah. broken pool on diversity. Yeah. And so um, that's going to be one where let's, let's meet together and, and get the right tree for the right spot at the right time of the year. And, and that also opens up a huge excitement in the industry right now and in that nurseries are low on trees it has been hmm. very difficult to get trees so expectation wise if you want a tree you know let's start thinking right away springtime right tree right spot some trees are spring dug some trees are fall dug yeah and yeah i, th- I think that's mean, important important point to your tree plan right yeah. You know, it, it, you might you might want a tree that uh, you've got to wait till fall to put in, and then, uh, and if you want a tree that uh, you, that goes in in the spring, you might have to hurry to get that one. As you say, if the trees are not available, you might have to wait another year. So these are really important. You're right, uh, Skeet, in that folks should get an expert out there to help them figure out what is the plan. Uh, how do yeah. we, how, what's the strategy for this? I see. Don't we have, wait for April. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like, now. like me. Uh, but uh, another question here. Uh, we're getting the the questions are pouring in, Skeet, because uh, they know. That's from Greg. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, he says, what is the best way to manage tree roots seeking water pipes? We had one main routed out last month. Some sources say to flush salt down the toilet to control roots seems bad for trees. We're going to be talking salt in the second uh, part of this show, by the way, putting in uh, sodium chloride and using it on your walks and driveways. Um, and you're right, Greg, the salt's not good for, uh, for living things, especially uh, plants. Uh, what about uh, water pipes and tree roots, Skeet? Sure. Tree roots are going to seek out the cracks that are in a water pipe. If there's no deficiency in the water pipe, there's no tree root issue. And so, and, and there's really nothing you can flush down a drain or a toilet to get rid of tree roots. You're, you're going to have to have those plumb, have a plumber come in and, and route those out. When that happens, the next step is to fix the pipe so you don't have this problem continue. So it, it's, yep. more of a, it, mm -hmm. it's more of getting the, the right piping without the breaks or cracks. Yeah, old old drain tile. It's old automatically going to be looking there. For there it. is a there is a um, a fallacy uh, out there that tree roots can break into your drain pipe, and that's not true. As you just mentioned, Skeet, tree roots are opportunistic. They will take advantage of a crack in a pipe because they're seeking water. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the idea that a tree root can break into your pipe is not true. It's just Correct. not. Um, so you're going to be better off fixing the pipe than trying yes. to deal with the tree root. Every, I mean, you can rot it out every year if you want, is a, a, but yeah, it costs... Or, or they come out with the root cutter through the pipes. Yeah, whatever, but you're still going to get more roots coming back because that crack is still there, and those tree roots mm -hmm. are going to find it eventually. Um, yes. So uh, that is something uh, to... Uh, we, you know, we had, uh, I had a little backup in my basement um, I, I have it from every three or four years, um, and I have to have it rotted Been out there, to the street. Yep. Yeah, I know. And this time we found some roots in there, but the main thing was we found a plastic bag and, and apparently it had filled with water and it was just blocking the pipe and how a plastic bag got down there. I don't know. I think it backed up from the street and then suddenly it was in there. Yeah. Uh, so, or, or something that somehow had gone down your drain pipe. It was on your roof. Yeah, down the drain pump. who knows? Yeah. Uh, but roots aren't always the issue. Uh, and again, uh, and Sandra Henry says, thanks for clarifying mm -hmm. the tree root pipe myth. And yeah, it's a myth. So um, take care of your pipes and you won't have the issue with your tree roots. Uh, by the way, that's Skeet from Bartlett Tree Experts. Go to uh, Bartlett.com. Uh, that's basil in the background. Uh, go to basil.dog.com. <laughs> 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 and you can all right i want to show some photos here that uh, that all right, have some fun. this is really yeah <laughs> let's fun basil keep barking you'll bark your approval bark your approval of these photos let's uh, bark, let, bark, 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 bark. let's go to this one. Oh, oh my, my. yeah nice huh uh yeah, what so, what have we got here skeet we, we have a, a nice u hedge in an islandish turnaround area and it how can you a, tell? <laughs> tell and so we might be getting a call come springtime that uh gee the the u shrub and the juniper underneath really kind of uh, looks looks odd and uh, you know <laughs> sector disease is attacking my tree and shrubs here and no that that would not be insect or disease that'd be mechanical damage from plow isn't yes. that something? And and how? All right. Here's a, here's another. Is this the same area or is that a different area? Different side. Okay, different side. And how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you tell people? The guy with the, you know, somebody somebody's on a bobcat. It's kind of tough to uh, to walk up to them and say, "Hey, leave my shrubs alone." Um, yes. It's uh, well, and this probably happens a lot more than people think. Yes. Yeah, and I would think some of it's also the, the, the property, where the snow has to go. If there's no places, and that's where it winds up sometimes. Right, right. And, and again, this is all part of the communication, working with associations to say, what are your expectations? You know, you, you want to put those shrubs right there 
so it gives you screening and it blocks. Well, if you're going to do that, then this is going to be the result wow. from winter. Well, or, you know, you're, it's a really good point. I'm going to go back to the other one here because uh, uh, here's the thing. Nobody's thinking about this until the snow hits. I can tell you that because I was out back shoveling my alley this past week and trying to figure out where to put the snow. Now, there are no shrubs mm -hmm. there that were going to get buried, but I could bury somebody's garbage can or their recycling bin or put snow in, in front of their gate so they couldn't get out. This is an issue. If you get 15 inches of snow, this is, you know, now the Bobcat guy is trying to figure out where to put it. Yes. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, but you're right. A planning is a good thing. If you've got those shrubs there and, and it only happens maybe once a year, this might be the only event of the year, but those shrubs, they sustain some damage and it's going to take a little while for them to bounce back. Isn't it Skeet? And it's there. You're absolutely correct. And it's going to be some hand pruning in spring and it's going to change the look. And so where, where do we want to go from here in the future? Yeah. And, it's a matter of the green team, the yeah. landscape, the homeowner, the property manager, and the certified arborist working together to create some solutions and expectations. And, and if these are low value, then great. Let's just pile the snow up, prune out the dead branches, and maybe come next year, we put in some tall grasses. We put in some different mm -hmm. ornamentals. We put something else into that spot. Um, so what we don't want to see is a surprise and disappointment come spring. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think a good thing of having the photos now because you forget about it once the weather changes. Yeah, so exactly. So take the pictures in the problem areas now so you can address it. Speaking of uh, damage, uh, yeah. yeah, that tree uh, mm. had a little accident. Actually, the tree didn't have the accident. Wow, this is uh, – let's put the – Poor tree. Well, let's look at what happened going up to this tree. And for the, those of you listening on the podcast, uh, we've got uh, bark removed at the base of a tree. You can see the bark on the ground in this shot. You can also see, guess what, tire tracks uh, leading. So we have a pretty good idea. <laughs> this is like a, it's almost like a Looney Tunes. Uh, I know it's not funny, um, but you know, where you see the, the snow tracks uh, in a tree, and then in the Looney Tune, of course, the tracks will go completely around the tree, and the, the person and keep would... keep going. And keep going, right. All right, so this... I'm going to show this. I want... Uh, Skeet sent this to me. Everybody look at the upper right-hand part of this video. Uh, you'll see some cars go by, and then you're going to see a little dropout for a second... Now, keep your eye up in the upper right hand, basically where the sun is, and you're going to see what happened to this tree. Here we go. Okay, the cars are going by. Okay, and keep your eyes kind of where the sun is, and there will be a dropout here in a second. Yep, and bam! Did you see that? car mm -hmm. it just whacked Hit the tree whacked that tree i'm going to do that one more time let's let's look at this again if you missed it and the I guy mean, comes around a turn or something and just keeps misses the road well yeah yeah there's a turn up there yeah there's something but that car goes and you can see the parts just flying there wow. yikes a, a skeet do you have any idea what happened there what was the story on that Okay. Well, the, the good news is that the person is okay. Um, and um, so, so. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's good. The, the safety devices in the car um, certainly um, came into effect and, and, and saved the person. Okay. Uh, this is a residential street, 25 miles an hour. You can see with the sun setting, sun to the person's back. Yeah. It's a, a little glazed over. This is you know, the picture you have up now is the next day. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they came around the corner too fast, unsafe conditions, driving un in unsafe conditions for the uh, snow and ice that were on the road and left the road and straight 
right into this uh, silver maple tree. All right. So the question I'm going to ask, looking at that tree, yeah. that, that tree can survive it, but it's not going to be happy, is it? No, the, the main concern, you know, we, we've got damage on the trunk of the tree and, and, and mm -hmm. it's not a great example, but boy, you know, think of somebody really, you know, you know, smacked you real hard or punched you real hard in your shoulder, you're going to be bruised and that tree is going to be bruised. Um, the other concern is um, the amount of fluid that came out of the car that was now dumped right at the base of that tree. Wow. So we've got radiator fluid. We've got windshield wiper fluid. We've got some oil. Uh, and yeah. so the, the amount of um, solvents. I didn't even think about that part of it. Yeah. I was looking uh, at the bark, uh, but you're right. All of that comes. And, and again, we'll talk about this. And, after. and the compression from the vehicle, too, probably on the roof. Yeah. Correct. Um, so, so that's the main concern to get out there right away and get the fluids out. The fluids are hot. The ground's frozen. It immediately melts, and it gets absorbed into the ground very quickly. That's that's the concern. That uh, you know, if I, if I if I said, "Hey, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna dump um, the entire radiator from your car at the base of your tree," you'd say, <laughs> "Well, yeah, yeah, it is," and that's what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, wow, that, that that's, that's a concern. Um, and and now we, you know so thank you. you you look at the the trunk of the tree and you look at that like okay that that's one aspect i'm, I'm more concerned of what just happened at the base of the, of the tree yeah all right one more yeah. thing we're, we're almost out of time here uh we didn't even get to freezing and thawing what kind yeah. of issues uh should folks be looking for uh we've got this intense cold uh if it yes. warm you know that's not so bad it's it's if it if it gets warm and then freezes again um yeah. If it's consistent, it's not a problem. So tell me a little bit about freezing thawing and, and how it affects sure. trees. You know, freezing thawing is one issue. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it to another aspect, Mike, and that is we've got a lot of snow on the ground for a long time. This is where we see the rabbit and deer damage on the trees. Ah, okay. You know, a more concern, as odd as this may sound. Um, that there's going to be the rabbits just don't have anything to eat. They can't forage because they don't see the grass. They don't. They can't get to it. So it, it's a matter of double checking the plants and trees you love. Have the chicken wire around them. Um, that that's going to be something to really more be a concern of. Yes, freezing and cold. It was a slow cooling into very cold. It's going to be very cold for a while. Is slowly going to warm up a little bit. Yeah, I'm not so, you know, trees that are that are um, in decline are not going to be doing well. Trees that are hardy and they've been on a, on a tree care plant, I'm very confident that that we're they're going to be doing fine. Um, I'm more concerned about um, rodent damage and uh, money damage. Well, yeah, that's that's a really good point. It's the same reason you don't. Uh, do the volcano mm -hmm. mulching because those critters can get in there and then they, they get to the bark of the tree and yeah. uh, they're going to cause problems. And yeah, Zan says they're eating her rose bushes too. Yeah. Rose bushes. Yes. You know, when you, when you see the, the, see the tracks of the snow, you, well, you know this, they're out there. Wait. All right. Well, this just, uh, again, uh, we have to reiterate that uh, you should go to Bartlett.com. You, you type in your zip code. Uh, and uh, they'll tell you where the nearby office, of course, Skeet, you work out of Northbrook, and there are four, I'm, I'm sorry, not Northbrook, uh, Bolingbrook, uh, yes. there are four offices in uh, in the Chicago area, so you, we're covered here, and there are a lot of places across the country where uh, you can get Bartlett services. Um, just go to Bartlett.com, type in your zip code, and then start talking. Start talking to a certified arborist uh, and, and, and working out a plan. Uh, Skeet, oh. it's all... It, yeah, it's great. It, it, thanks for the photos and the uh, love the visual aids. Always love it. That's just uh, too cool. Um, Good. And uh, uh, I appreciate having you back. And this time you weren't five minutes behind your audio. <laughs> uh, your, your visual wasn't five minutes behind. It's all kind of much better. And um, good luck staying warm with your crews and keep, uh, keep getting them donuts and coffee. Sounds like a plan to me. Really appreciate the opportunity to express what we love to do. We, we love to help clients and trees.
And I know you do. All right. Thanks a lot. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. When we come back, as we said before, it's uh, winter. There's, There's ice, there's snow, and there's salt. And we'll tell you how they can all get along together. My name is Megan Kosensky, and I'm a plant health care specialist and a grounds person at Bartlett Tree Experts. It's no secret that the world of arboriculture is a male-dominated industry, but there is a fearless group of women out there that are determined to change that, and I'm really proud to be one of those women. Bartlett has been really great about recognizing any kind of roadblocks for different genders, different races, people of different nationalities, and just kind of taking a bulldozer to all of those roadblocks. Every day that I go to work, I find something new that I love about what I do. Every tree needs a champion. Hello from Happy Leaf. This is BJ Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup-son of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn, serene. And Give welcome back to the Mike Novak hey, hey. Show with Peggy Malecki. Uh, did you go uh, play with uh, Basil there just to make sure he's okay? Um, to toss yeah, a bone. he's got a couple cookies. Uh, refilled his water bowl. I know. Um, hey, uh, I'm, I'm he's, hoping... He's, uh, yeah. <laughs> he's he's he is what he is today. He's he's out there and it's cold and there's trucks and there you go. Uh I I Mitch, are are you there by any chance? There you are. I couldn't see your uh your visual there and and then you popped it up. Okay, good. You you had me scared there. You people do this to me all the time. They just want to scare me. Mitch is the president. <laughs> hey Mitch. Of, hey Peggy, uh, good morning. Uh, Mitch is the president of Play Safe Ice Blocker. Where, where are we talking to you from? Where are you located exactly? The Ice Melt Center of Winston Salem, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, why, why are you down there making ice uh, 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 de-icer? Because Winston Salem, you, uh, although you have a little bit today, don't you? You have a little bit of something going on, don't you? Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know what to call it. It's um, <laughs> not very impressive. I did my duty, by the way. I have. I have my uh, scars from five years in Chicago and ah. ten years in Boston. So I know what you guys are dealing with. I've had weeks, like you're going to have, where it didn't get into positive numbers. So I know something about this. About what you're going oh, through. Oh yeah. Hey, the pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is kind of what we're dealing with here. As a matter of fact, you know, looking at the the weather forecast, and um, I'm going to give a ding to our meteorologist, Rick DeMaio. Yeah, it's kind of scary what he texted us. Woo. Uh, well, yeah, he just sent us a text, but he also, two weeks ago, predicted this when nobody else in town was talking about it. Um, and we, we asked him on the air, we said, Rick, uh, nobody, uh, nobody's saying anything about this. He says, oh, well, here's what the maps are telling me. And he was spot on. Um, 
And then, you know, he predicted the first weekend, and we'll get to that when I, t when I talk to him, but uh, he, then he predicted the second weekend of it. And I said, Rick, nobody else is saying this. And he said, this is what the maps are telling me. So uh, he was, he was uh, bang on with that. So, uh, Mitch, you, you know all about this. As you say, you've had uh, uh, battle scars from living in Chicago and Boston. Um, so why in heck did you decide uh, to do uh, a product like a PlaySafe Ice Blocker? Uh, how did that come about? Well, um, first, it's good to be with you guys. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I think it's a um, obviously a timely topic for a lot of the country. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. People that are too in. And um, um, it's part of a bigger theme for us. We're pet owners and um, uh, pet lovers, and we, mm -hmm. uh, we have this bigger vision of making the outdoors safer for uh, everybody. We, we tend to believe that people with pets live longer. And it's partially because the stuff they do to make their house safe for their pets is good for them, too. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways that pets protect us, right? So mm -hmm. um, we started with a, um, a bit of technology, which was uh, organic fertilizers and weed and grass control. And um, we were presented with this opportunity uh, by, from, from a um, supplier to the aviation industry, and we took them up on it. And... Um, we really have shifted our entire focus into the um, into this technology because it's so compelling, and um, uh, and the the impact on our brand and on families and on pets is substantial. So that's, uh, how, we're, that's how we got here. Okay, yeah, you've had a, a lot of experience. I'm going to ask you to do two things. One is tilt down just a little bit. All right, tilt your. Uh, I don't know if you can do that. Did, we, we went through this the other day. There we go. Ah, there we go. Now you're more centered. That's much better. I'm sorry about that. I move all over the place. I, can't I, I, I know. <laughs> you know, the problem now is not only am I doing audio, I'm doing visual, and i got to keep uh, up with all of it. Um, why is uh, sodium so bad? I mean, I, I, I wrote about it. Go to my blog, MikeNovak.net. I mean, I know the answer to this, <laughs> but I'm going to ask <laughs> you, uh, having worked uh, on uh, a product like this, and 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 all um, in full disclosure, you know, it's a product, play safe, play safe ice blocker, and you can go to the link there. It's playsafeiceblocker.com. You can find out about it. We'll tell you what what uh, is involved in it, what uh, what the uh, active ingredients are. Um, why is salt so bad, however, Mitch? Well, salt is, uh, <clears throat> let me just be a little provocative getting to that answer. Love it. Um, I'm going to say, you know, people, we started pouring uh, salt, chloride salt, onto roads in New Hampshire in the 40s. Nothing has changed in that business in the following 70 years. It's basically chloride salt trying to, you pour it onto ice, it attempts to, if it's not too cold, to burrow through the ice and break the surface bind. And depending on the temperature and the moisture level of the snow and all those things, the impact of what you're using is going to be a little unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, you never you never quite know how it's going to behave or how long it's going to talk take. Some of it has to do with is there sunshine. Some of it has to do with uh, ground temperature. And there are entire classes that the professionals go to to get certified on how to match the right salt to the right weather condition. Um, so that's a long way around your your question of all of that chloride salt that we've been pouring on roads and sidewalks and steps all makes its way into fresh water. And, all right, and, and, I, and I will throw in a fun fact here. This is not so much fun if you're uh, the victim of salt. One teaspoon, one teaspoon of chloride salt corrupts five gallons of water. Okay, so if you want to, if you want to translate that, one fifty-pound bag of ice melt ruins. Are you ready for this? Ten thousand gallons of fresh water. So you buy that fifty-pound bag at the store. You're going to the Home Depot. You're going to Lowe's. Wherever you go. Uh, you get the 50-pound bag because it's cheap. 
and you use the whole thing. Uh, you've contributed to 10,000 gallons of fresh water being contaminated. Is that right, Mitch? Well, not many people know that fact. You went deep into the files for that one. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that's exactly spot on. Um, but I'm going to pan back just a little bit more and say, now professionals have been using liquids to pre-treat ice for 20 years. Oh. Mm -hmm. You have been seeing those white lines on the, on the street. And the reason they do that is to keep ice from sticking to the surface. Pre-treatments work from the bottom up. The um, de-icers work from the top down. And um, the, the, the reason professionals do it that way is they, won't, they don't want ice to form on the roads before they can get back to it and start removing the snow. So um, the... the the reason that's such a big deal in states that have a lot of freshwater lakes, 99% of all the ice, of the, all the salt applied ends up in our water system because it's all mobile. None of it is plant positive. Um, yeah. I've read where you see, where you say that, um, and, and I've not been around it recently, but you can pretty much tell how bad the winter was by how much crabgrass there is around the sun. Hmm. Yeah, so, I've I've known that for for years. I had a, a friend of mine who was a an organic lawn care guy, and he said, "Oh, you want to know?" And I, I even heard my friend Ron Cowgill say this the other day. He he does uh, Mighty House Home Improvement, and you can go to my, my, thank you, give him a ding, MightyHouse.net. <laughs> and I I was watching his the latest video, and he happened to be talking about products just like we are today. Yeah. And he mentioned yes. it. And, and so if you've got lots of crabgrass, I can tell you where it's going to be. It's going to be at the side of your driveway. It's going to be the side of your sidewalk where you killed off your turf and the crabgrass moved in. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've got to actually have a question, too. All right. We, can we take a question there, uh, Mitch? Let's do it. Okay. So you were talking about um, the pre-moistening, uh, the, the, the liquid. Uh, right. before well, it snows yeah before so, we get i see the question uh, peggy yeah. before we get to the question let's establish okay. something because i think you kind of uh glazed over it <laughs> to to use a phrase here mitch um but i'm bumped. and i uh, thank you wait oh i don't i don't have the uh the the the, the rim, rim shot, shot uh set up wait a second here it is thank you um <laughs> See, you got to have sound effects, Mitch, wherever Mitch you go. Mitch is shaking his head like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> um, but your product is, I want to call it a, 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 a pre-de-icer. Um, a liquid. Uh, well, it, it's a liquid, but the idea is you want to stop ice before it forms, whereas the salt products attack the ice after it forms. Is that correct? Yes, our, prim our basic working premise and my, my PR group and, and all the, uh, the smarter marketing people than me that I'm around tell me I shouldn't really scream about this, but I can't help but say, for those 70 years that all we've heard about from, um, for home use is ice melts. And keep in mind, they're all made from three chloride salt. So it's hard to distinguish themselves from a performance standpoint. That's what all right, all right. so so let's let's stop there. Let's examine that as well. So what are the different chloride salts? You've got sodium chloride, right? Which works which works to about twenty degrees. Okay. Becomes unreliable under twenty. Magnesium chloride works reliably to five degrees. And then calcium chloride is really the only thing Chicago land should be using right now because it's the only thing that's going to activate it. And chloride salts not to make this too wonky, but chloride salts need two things in order to dissolve, right? They need heat and moisture. So mm -hmm. they need different levels of heat based upon, and, and they're not chemicals. They're all naturally mined products. Just want to get that out there. So they, but they each stop working at 20 degrees. So if I've got rock salt, let's show you how clever the marketing industry is on this. Um, if I've got a rock salt, and it's colder than 20, so it's not dissolving. The marketing guys talk about how it adds traction because it's just laying <laughs> on top of the guys, not working on anything. So um, never give, and, and when you give, the other thing about this industry is it's totally unregulated. So the promises they make on the package are totally untethered 
to the chemicals or the the blends inside. Yeah. So you've got to really watch everything uh, with an eye. And if I could just kind of circle the wagons here and say, why we think ice melting is so dumb now that there's a solution that prevents it, you know, it's the difference between you've got a choice, you know, 40 years ago, we, the industry and industry gave you the decision to make whether you wanted to treat sunburn after the fact or if you wanted to prevent it altogether. Yeah. We're now there with, with, with ice. You can now prevent ice altogether. You can pre-treat and spend 20 minutes, and here's what you do. You take a product. Ours isn't the only one. I'd like to think I'm an ambassador for this new wave of solution. But you take a product. They're all ready to use. You pour them into your pump sprayer. And you lightly spray it onto whatever you're really concerned about around the house or and, and what you should be concerned about around the house for your mail delivery, uh, sanitation workers, etc. And That's... legally, and legally um, towns like Boston and Chicago have sidewalk clearing provisions. So uh, for all for because they're trying to protect all of these um, essential people. But um, but you basically pour the product sprayer and you walk around and you lightly mist it a gallon will do 2,000 square feet a gallon will do 2,000 square feet it will prevent ice that's why airline I wish Rick was here he'd talk about how airlines do it and that's why road crews do it they're just trying to keep ice from forming underneath it's the same concept as um, as cooking spray if you think about how you use paint on a frying pan, it keeps food from sticking. This does the same thing with ice, just without the slippery part of it. All right, and, and let's. But and the reason it does it is is the uh, the chemical you use, which is not uh, as you said before. The the pellets are sodium chlor chloride, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride. Uh, no, wait. Well, where does potassium chloride come into all of this? There, it's a it's in the suite of products that can be inserted in lieu of one of those chlorides. It's not typically used in uh, residential products. I You'll use it. Some, I've but, got some that I use uh, to cook because it's it's what they call light salt potassium chloride. They're on the wrong show. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got we we'll we'll have the cooking aspect uh, coming up uh, later on. Uh, but your what is it that is in place safe ice blocker? So um, we use acetates. Acetates are salts, but they're more friendly. They're more readily used by the um, by the by the by turf. In fact, there are a lot of fertilizers, soil amendments that are actively using uh, potassium acetate, um, and it's not mobile and you use a fraction of it. So potassium acetate, if you look that up, you're going to see it's the most used um, material on airstrips for two reasons. One, it's highly effective in drastic weather like you're having now, and it's um, non-corrosive to all the plane side equipment, um, and it's easy on the metal of the rebar in the concrete. So um, potassium acetate is half the formulation, and the other half of the formulation is CMA and water. Uh, CMA, what CMA is? Calcium magnesium acetate. Okay. And those are two, we, we, plain, we plainly mark those on the package. It is also important to note that a lot of products that you'll find in the market do not have to disclose their ingredients. It is not required. Yeah, you, uh, you you tell me that it's kind of the Wild West out there, and that's kind of the most disturbing part of this is that, uh, you know, one of the things you're trying to do is keep our pets safe. Let, let me let me stop for a second because I want I want to get to something that's really that's important is is the damage that salt can do. As I, as I mentioned, it can contaminate. Um, you know, one teaspoon can contaminate five gallons of water, but it's also killing your plants when it gets into uh the uh the soil it's hard to get out i i put a, a link there uh from illinois extension um about what um the the problems uh posed by salt um it says um 
A less common but more serious plant ailment can occur if salt-laden meltwater infiltrates the soil profile. In these case, cases, soil very near a source of salt, such as a heavily treated sidewalk or similar surface, accumulates sodium. The impact is often very concentrated as meltwater tends to have well-defined drainage ways. That's something you got to keep in mind. The water's draining in the same place every single time, um, unless it gets blocked. Uh, now, as sodium accumulates in the soil profile, it can have dramatic effects on soil properties uh, from raising pH to destruction of soil structure that ultimately results in additional soil compaction. This damage is often more serious due to wide-ranging effects on plants because it is very difficult or sometimes impossible to remediate. And that's one of the issues that, you know, people say, well, I'll just flush it out in the spring. Well, that might work and that might not work. It kind of depends on what your drainage is like. Again, what we be we believe we're finally in a place where there is a, there's a, this is not um, two things about these products that are coming along now. And Branch Creek makes a great product called Entry. Um, um, there are beet products that will have mm -hmm. some potentially discoloration. I mean, there's some yeah. issues. But, but they use that on roads too. Liquid, when you go to, yes, um, when you go to liquids, you bring in a wider solution set or a bigger mm -hmm. toolbox of anti-icers than you do de-icers. There's only three. Um, and there are some that are chloride-free, which eliminates all that problem. But let's step back just for a second now that you've, we've established all that fun, all the benefits. It is just dumb. Now that you've got this option to prevent ice like a pro, melting ice and removing ice is just dumb. I mean... And because, let's just forget, let's say it was neutral to all this pet and um, soil issues that you're talking about, you would save yourself a ton of time because you're going to spend 15 minutes before snow, and when you take your shovel out, when the snow stops, there's going to be no ice underneath. And you're not going to have to walk on the ice to apply ice milk. So you're going to trade 15 minutes. Yeah. You're going to trade 15 minutes before snow for two or three hours after snow of work. So if you're if you're getting a 10-inch a, a snowfall, you're still going to have the snow there. You're just not going to have the ice forming underneath, right? layer of ice under it. That's correct, which is where all the pain is, right? Yeah. I mean, all of the real pain. I mean, you know, we can shovel. Shovel's one thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can spend 40 minutes shoveling, and all you've done is ended the first round of the fight, right? you got three more rounds to go because you got to get the bag. <laughs> You gotta get the bag out of your trunk, that fifty pound bag. Hope it don't break. You gotta walk on the <laughs> ice with it. You gotta walk on the ice with it. You gotta sprinkle it and you don't know how much because well, well, okay, right? let's stop there too, because here's the other thing about that. People put ten times as much as they need. Um, all right, here's I last week I talked about this on the show uh, be, that I looked like the crazy old guy on the block <laughs> because um, when we got the big snow last week, I was in the back getting trying to get the uh, alley cleaned out. I come to the front door, and my uh, Good Samaritan neighbor is putting salt on my stairway. And I ran out the door. I went, no salt, no salt, no salt. And he must have thought I was nuts. And then later on, uh, a couple hours later, maybe, maybe not a couple hours, maybe an hour later, I come out, and my neighbor from the other side, is throwing okay. salt down on, and I'm running out the door going, no salt, no salt. And um, it's hard to explain to them that the, these are damaging product. That's a damaging product. And I really don't want it because it's going to kill my plants and it's going to hurt the, the pets. I'm just uh, the point at, at some point in the next three to five years, after we do around the shows like this, people will understand that they're forget forget all of the soil forget all the pet just save yourself some agony of <laughs> of working so hard and this is not something this is not like most environmental products it is not like most pet safety products where you have to trade performance to be gentle to a um Something you care about. Yeah, but but but, but, but that's an important point too because I, we haven't century. talked about we haven't talked about the pets yet, and that's a very important part of this. As you mentioned on your own website, any of the pelleted products 
are going to be harmful to your pets. Can you explain a little bit about that? Well, it's uh, I, the reason, and, and we did this in a perfect order because what I really want people to understand is that first things first, the worst liquid is better than the best pellet product. Okay. Because you're preventing a problem, you're not solving a problem. And I doubt there's any place in your show ever where you said, I just let it go and solve it later. <laughs> Fixing, preventing a problem is a lot better than um, um, dealing with it after the fact. Ice is no solution. And there's emergency rooms full of people that thought, I, that thought rock salt would fix the problem. Um, I don't know if I can really uh, get this done. I might have to figure out how to get this. But when you look at this, this is a pet yeah. safe ice. I'm going to try to hit it. Yeah, I can see yeah. it. There you go. We can see it. Yeah. So, but if you look at it in a, um, if you look at it, I'm going to. Okay, up a little, a little higher. There we go. There we go. Now I know what it's like. To now to your left, to your left, and up. And now till. There we go. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, I should have practiced more. Everything's backward here. <laughs> That's a pet safe product. That's sold with a cute dog on the label. And if I could, um, if I can get it centered, you can see how jagged yep. all of those pellets are. Yeah. That is not fun in a pet paw, even if that was designed not to be um, irritating, which that is salt. It's colored salt in a pet bottle sold at a pet store. Um, that would be painful to a pet. Um, and, and the worst part of, of any of these products are that they're irritating to a pet paw just by getting trapped into a paw. Um, yes, they can be they can upset their tummies. It's not really a mortality issue. It's an irritation issue. And I will tell you, if you, I, I, I've walked down some sidewalks in Boston and seen my dogs step on um, a salt-treated sidewalk. And you got to remember, in the winter, their paws are dry and cracked anyway, right? And you're walking them on sidewalks, and it's making it worse. And the minute salt hits that is no fun. And it is an immediate squeal, and they start licking their paws, and it becomes a problem. So pre-treating with a liquid, there's nothing to get trapped in their paw. Probably nothing to hurt their tummy. Yeah. And there's no ice out there, that, and they suffer the same kind of injuries from slips and falls um, that we do, although the falls aren't so bad. Yeah. Closer to the ground, now, of course, now, Mitch, with, with the pre-treat and the, the acetate in there, is there any residue that gets left on their paws? Or is it something that dries right away? No, no, no. There's nothing that really transfers. Um, there's nothing that transfers in any way. There's not mm -hmm. enough to. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and you can put them right on it. The other, the other problem when you remember this is an unregulated industry. Yeah. So when you buy a product that's not as safe as you, you know, when you, you can buy rock salt at a pet store and pay, or not a pet store, but at a. Uh, Anywhere at a, uh, a I guess store. Grade a, I guess Great Ace isn't there in Chicago anymore, right? Uh, oh no, Ace it is. is. Ace oh, Hardware, really? yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The Great Ace, the Great Ace over by Pequods. Is it still there? <laughs> I, have no oh, idea. I don't know about that one, but there's there's right. Ace Hardware's around. <laughs> but okay. the big box but store. Buy, let's put it that way. <laughs> anywhere, um, you can buy a fifty pound bag for forty cents a pound. They they color rock salt, put a pet on it. And it's um, fourteen dollars for a jug of eight pounds. Yeah, and I want we're we're running out of time here, so I want to get to some really important points. Uh, one is what's the product? Somebody said, well, look at your screen. It's PlaySafeIceBlocker.com, and you can get that at uh, any of the big, well, not any of them, but certainly at uh, Home Depot, and you can get it at mm -hmm. Lowe's, right? Yeah, Mitch. And the the there website gives buy. links. Yeah, there's a web there's a where to buy page. Um, mm -hmm. Go to right, it. Right, right. Um, go there. Well, there we're almost. Amazon has got us almost sold out. I think we, when I came on air, there were three units left um, fulfilled by Amazon. I'm shipping out of here. You might get a little love note from me in your package, but um, uh, we'll and, see you. And, and, and PetFlow. Let me, can I say this? I need yeah. to. PetFlow.com. 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 Listen to this story. So they would not take the category. They never have stocked 
an ice belt before for all these issues. We are the first product, ice safety product, that they've ever allowed in their, uh, on their site. Um, you, uh, they, they service you in two days. They've got a Midwest Fulfillment Center. Um, they're on, the, they're on both coasts too. Um, you'll be blown away by their service and um, they have it and it's starting to show up in your local pet stores too. Go ask for it. Fill the pet. I, uh, to get there. okay. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned is that the, the, the pet products that claim they're safe, try to find the ingredients. They're not listed and they don't have to list them as you say as it's kind of the wild wild west out there um i had somebody just write say it's not showing up at amazon right now so we might want to look at that uh does menards carry it do you know does menards carry not it? yet not, not yet. yet okay I, uh, guys number i want you to call and, I'm just kidding. and the other question <laughs> was uh all right the comment and then a question the comment was uh the majority of snows around here, there should be no need for chemicals if folks are shoveling effectively. It's like, that's the first thing is just get out and shovel, get it out of the way. Yeah, uh, but that said, how far in advance do you put this on for it to be effective? Well, uh, we didn't get to that. You can put this out uh, 20, uh, 48 hours before snowfall. It's not going to dilute and you're not going to track it away. It's <laughs> unlike a pellet in that regard. Uh, you'll see road crews put it out four or six hours and with thousands of cars driving over it. It doesn't, um, it's, it's there. What, what, it, it stays where you spray it. Okay. And uh, Amazon says only one left in stock order soon. Uh, Candace blank just wrote, I just bought the last one. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Candace. Uh, no, there's more, there's more. If you look under, um, keep once they, they'll deactivate that. And then you'll see um, that uh, play, the aviation grade play safe is going to yeah. fulfill it. That's yeah. Me. Yeah. It'll go out same day, lightning yeah. fast. Yeah. All yeah. right. Visit, wanna, visit that store. store. It's right there. Well, our, one, can I make one other real quick? Real, real quick. Amazon, go there and just look at their top 50 products. All, tons of pet safe products. They're all magnesium chloride. They're all magnesium chloride. So um, compare us to that. Uh, my caution would be uh, keep your pets off of all ice melts, irrespective of what's on the label, um, mm -hmm. and don't pay the pet tax for the um, for pretend safety. And, that would and, be my and so folks that. don't get confused. Your product is calcium magnesium acetate. So you're looking for the acetates, not the chlorides. That's right. And because they're, they're not, um, the acetates are just a totally different type of salt. And yeah. uh, that's a... That that'll be um, that'll be um, the next section when you do the difference between chlorides and uh, but this has been great. This has been great. I appreciate you doing it. <laughs> well, I'd you love know. To now send some of that warm air this way towards us from and, from down south there. Yeah, and you have to. Yeah. Uh, you uh, 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 you have to pay the price for being on the show. So if you buy one of the chloride products... Don't be a jerk. Okay, that's what we tell people. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do that every time they touch one. Can we do that every time they touch one? Uh, yeah, every time you even think about doing uh, that, we'll play... Don't be a jerk. All right, there you go. Uh, Mitch... It hurts to do that. Yeah, <laughs> Mitch Vestal, uh, gonna listen. thank I'm you gonna so listen much. To the weather guy. I'm going to uh, yeah. to the weather guy. Ask him a question about what they use on the airports. I'm going to ask him what they yep. use. Well, on he the... did. He Rick did aviation meteorology for years. I know that's ask what. Him what they, ask him what they use, and um, and ask him if there's a way to make money on being right weather forecasting. Can we bet on these things? <laughs> well, we're going to give him some kudos today because he's uh, the guy who's uh, done it right for I'm the staying. last couple of weeks. I'm all right. Uh, you know what? You hang on there. If we get a chance to, maybe we'll get you in the conversation. Kind of depends what happens here. Uh, again, go to PlaySafeIceBlocker.com. It, uh, it is at Lowe's. It is at uh, Home Depot. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. I'm not a fan of Amazon, but then I, I don't have to go there. Uh, and uh, and uh, we hope uh, that you take care of the environment and your pets. Thank you, Mitch, so much for being on the show with us. Good fun. All right, Rick DeMaio, meteorologist extraordinaire, coming up.
Hello from Happy Leaf. This is BJ Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. At Sitka Salmon Shares, we take pride in being a seafood company that's a little different. In fact, 10 seasons ago, our motto was we do salmon differently. Nowadays, we harvest 15 species of wild-caught Alaskan fish, but still call ourselves Sitka Salmon Shares because, well, we're a little different. Our difference starts with our fleet of fishermen Hello. who own a slice of the company mm. and are paid above industry average. They deliver fish to our docks in about half the time as other fishermen, which means higher quality of fish for you. And we never buy our fish from large processors where we don't know how each fish was caught or handled, like most other companies do. Another difference is our fish plant, which we own too. Our plant freezes fish about twice as cold and twice as fast as the other guys. This produces unparalleled quality at a cellular level. Ooh. Our difference extends to you too. By joining our community, you band together with thousands of other people who want to make a difference in the way that their food is produced. This allows our fishermen to harvest fish just for you, with the respect, thought, and care that the fish, the ocean, and you deserve. So, be a little different. Join us at SitkaSalmonShares.com. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. And welcome back to the show. Boy, I don't know what it is about the, the 10 o'clock segments that I can never get <laughs> can never get us out of there on time. But uh, uh, and 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 uh, you can see the map is there. Rick is not oh, there's there's the Rick right there. He's he's getting his scones. <laughs> oh good. He texted me a picture of cinnamon rolls and scones. Thanks, Rick. Wow, where's yeah. where's ours? In the mail. Right here. Oh, 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 thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those amazing cinnamon, cinnamon rolls and the savory scones you, bought, you brought over the last time you were in the studio. Yeah, that was from um, Benison's. Uh, uh -huh. These are from the Great Harvest Bread Company on um, Central yeah. in, um, uh, in Evanston. The other one was on... Did you have to wait in line this morning? Um, no, no, it was amazing. Um, uh, it was pretty much quick in and out. I mean, that was like two people in front of me, but it, but yeah. I waited inside, so it yeah. wasn't yeah. too bad. I was, I, I've, I was I've queued up down the street for Great Harvest sometimes. Yeah, I know. Uh, so you know what I'm talking about. They're the biggest scones in the world, aren't they, Pig? They're great. Yeah. Um, but um, I was hoping to get down to the lakefront to take a quick picture, uh, but I looked at the clock. I'm like, I got to get back for the world famous Mike Novak, Peggy Malecki show. So. <laughs> Thank you. So I would expect you're, you're sending the scones to both of our homes, right? <laughs> uh, the crumbs. How about that? I, uh, I, we expect to see something pop up uh, sooner or later. So, uh, 
uh, with, we hope folks, they, send with, cinnamon with, rolls. <laughs> with, with, with two kids, with two kids and a dog. Look, he's waiting for a skull oh, right there. Oh, <laughs> look at that! Oh dear! Oh, Jax. Dear. Yeah, so, yeah um, so as soon as I as soon as I bring it out, he's basically sitting there like that. Um, but if you hear him bark, that means that he sees the squirrels out here. Uh, um, and I mean, you know, I remember we did we did a something like this in um, Natural Awakenings a few years ago, Peg about mm -hmm. what exactly should we be feeding our furry friends. Um, so did you, want to, did you guys want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, in extreme cold and deep snow, what, what do we feed? I forget exactly what we came up with in that article, Peg. I don't have it in front of me, but um, a lot of the things that I have been reading, if you are feeding them uh, high protein, you know, um, suet, I've got suet out and the, um, during the show, uh, you know, the suet blocks that you get in the feeder. I've had right. um, numerous right. woodpeckers and nuthatches coming and going the whole show. So high protein things, you know, you don't want to be throwing bread out to them. That's not, that's not helping anybody. Uh, yeah. No. So like things like, um, like walnuts, Brazil nuts, granola, things like that. That's okay. Um, I not, not the expert on that. So I don't want to, okay. I don't want to quote it yeah. exactly. But things yeah, like the high protein suets are, you know, woodpeckers are going to be seeking that out. And, you know, people say, oh, I don't want the grackles. I don't want the sparrows. Well, in this weather, you know, they have to eat too. Yeah. All, yeah. Of, the, and, all, all the birds, especially all the squirrels, the, um, everybody's hungry out there. Yeah. Yeah, especially with, with the deep snowpack. And I can go through some of the numbers here. Um, overnight low temperature made it down to uh, minus 6 at O'Hare. Uh, the record was minus 10 which is actually kind of odd because you would think this time of the year you'd easily have records like 15 to 18 below, but this was one of those warm records, and this goes all the way back, believe it or not, to 1875 that we have not yet broken a record for this date. Um, but there were many locations close by that got close to that. Uh, let's see, minus 4 at Midway and Northerly Island, uh, minus 11 at the National Weather Service office down near Romeoville, uh, 10 below at Rockford, 10 below at DuPage County Airport, minus 8 up in Waukegan, um, minus 17, the perennial cold spot at Aurora, uh, minus 6 at Wheeling up in Northbrook. So just about everybody, um, even the lakefront. And the winds kind of lightened up a little bit last night. Um, and because of that, you're able to get colder in some of your yeah. outlying areas. But I've, I've seen it where if, you're, if you have a 20-mile-an-hour wind, you're just as cold at the lakefront than you are inland. So at that point, when you have deep snowpack, uh, the urban heat island really doesn't help out too yeah. much. But a yeah, little bit, it was completely yeah, clear. So so clear in the sky last night that. Yeah, yeah this this was about um, as pure of an Arctic air mass as you can get. Mm -hmm. So we had that little bit of snow. We got about an inch uh, in some places, but you can see very quickly road salt doesn't work well. The roads were covered up fairly well got about two inches to the south of us did you hear um, us uh talking ahead uh, in the segment uh before we were talking about the different products you could use as you say sodium uh doesn't work because it's working down to sodium. 25 right. but uh and and the guy w we had on the show uh mitch vestal uh, uh has a product that uses acetate uh calcium in fact in fact uh real quick uh, I'm going to pop him into the screen there on the right. Uh, Mitch, I want you to meet uh, Rick DeMaio. Um, hey, Rick. And, and Rick, Hi, you, Mitch. Uh, Mitch knows about the sort of things that they treat planes with, and you have talked about that uh, all the time. Um, and um, these are products, <laughs> you if you're treating a plane, it's got to work. Um, so uh, w what... Uh, what kind of uh, experience do you have with that, Mitch, uh, in terms of, of uh, treating planes? We actually get this material from the aviation industry. So it's um, um, mostly runway material, Rick, um, potassium acetate. And then, of course, they use mostly glycols on the wings, right? Right. Um, it yeah. melts the ice because they apply it at like 120 degrees. Is my information pretty accurate? Yeah, there, there's, there's, it, there's two types of processes that you use for airplanes. There's type 1 and type 4. Um, the type 1 is a, is a heated, and that removes the snow, and the type 4 is a cold, and that keeps the snow from reforming. So 
one of the things that I did for the airlines was you just don't forecast, you know, four to six inches of snow. You forecast snow per hour on the half hour and sometimes 15 minutes. So they know if there's going to be, you know, if the, if the flakes are going to go to dry, is the wind going to help them out where it blows the snow off the surface of the airplane? Uh, especially if you have planes that are sitting out overnight, that's a lot of surface area that you now have mm -hmm. to remove. So you can, you can remove it either with blowers. You don't want to be applying, you know, uh, 2,000 gallons of fluid onto four inches of, you know, snow. So you Yikes. blow the snow off. Then you use the heated, as Mitch was talking about. Um, and then once the plane has been de-iced or de-snowed, if it has to be used, say, two hours later, um, and it's still snowing, you apply the type four, which is a cold fluid. And what that is, it's like a gel. So it adheres to the surface of the plane. And it's almost like, um, uh, it, it's, it's almost like the stuff they would have in your, in your, um, uh, in your car where, it, where it, it, it thins out when it gets warm, but when it's cold, it works just the same. So the viscosity um, actually thickens up a little bit. So that keeps the snow from forming. So what happens is you don't have to de-ice your airplane twice. So one, once you get the de-icing fluid on there, it'll usually work for about 40 or 45 minutes. So when the plane taxis to the uh, beginning of the runway, which can sometimes be a taxi delay of a half hour to 45 minutes, if it goes beyond a certain time, then you have to get de-iced again. And that costs a lot of money because you don't want to have to go back to the gate. So they'll have those machines and those de-icers at the beginning of the runway, the end of the runway, whichever way you're pointing. And then you'll get another shot of de-icing fluid. And typically what happens when the plane is going down the runway, it begins to lift up, the de-icing fluid falls off the wings. Uh, so it's a real, it's a real science. Um, but it costs about 8 to $10 a gallon. So if you have a 737, right, right. it could easily run you three, dollars $4,000 a plane. To wow. de-ice. Wow. Yeah. And wow. when you're getting into like when you're getting into like a seven sixty seven or a seven seven seven, you're talking about six, seven thousand dollars per airplane, which is why airlines like to cancel and put everybody on one plane. It costs a huge amount of money to run an airline in an airport during a snowstorm. Hey, salts salts on runways. Do they they attract animals, right? Um, yeah, I think the plane noise kind of scares them away, <laughs> right. but, uh, right. but yeah, they don't, they don't try to use a lot of salt on runways. They use like a brine, um, which is like a combination of, uh, some sort of, you know, vegetable fluid and urea on the, on the runways as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of science. I mean, I teach a class on different ways that airports operate in different types of temperatures. Um, and a lot of people say, well, why don't they, why don't they just have heated runways? Um, that's, that's really right. costly <laughs> to have an entire 10,000-foot stretch of concrete heated. Um, yeah. I mean, you've got to heat it. You've got you to install it. You've got to maintain and it. And the maintenance, yeah. The maintenance is huge, right. So, so there's a whole bunch of work that goes into all that stuff. But uh, the Europeans have really been um, first with their science of de-icing because they get the kind of snow that's kind of wet and it sticks where you can get, you know, like the snow that we had yesterday just literally blows right off the, um, the airplanes. So you can, you can probably get away with just like one de-icing fluid, like the type one, and then you're fine. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of money is made when airlines follow the procedures and the science behind de-icing. Otherwise, if all you're doing is de-icing airplanes, by the, by the time you get to the end of February, you're out of money and you're out of fluid. Yeah. So All far, right. So far, so far All this right. has been that great. That was great. That All was right. great. Uh, Mitch, uh, thank you so much. It was, it's been great having you. I'll, I'll leave you on uh, in the background if you want to continue to watch the show, but uh, we'll get back to uh, to Rick here. Thanks for uh, stopping in again. Good to meet nice you, Rick. All right. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned uh, – I want to give you kudos. Two weeks ago what? because you said – all of this was coming. Well, he gets, and he gets double kudos, too. He gets double kudos because two weeks ago you said, this is coming, and we, we Peggy and I hadn't heard it anywhere else. And then like two a, a day later, people are going, oh, yeah, it's going to get cold. And then you said, oh, that cold's going to stick around for a second weekend, and I didn't hear that last weekend. And then suddenly everybody's saying, oh, yeah, the cold's going to stick around. How is it you knew this and nobody else in town did? 
I don't know. I mean, I, I look at trends and I look long range and I see where things are happening. And I mean, probably because I, I'm talking with a friend of mine who I used to work with at United and my best friend, John Davis, who's now working for DHL. He's over in Europe and he looks long range. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't, I don't watch TV weather. Um, I rarely <laughs> look at, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't watch, it's nothing against them. I just, I do my own thing and I don't try to be intimidated or, or, you know. Oh, I don't think you are. I just you. think you, you are following whatever you see. I'm just surprised. We, Peggy and I were both surprised cause we were, we thought, oh, is, is Rick out on a limb here and boom, you nailed it. You absolutely nailed well, it. I actually went too cold for this weekend. And part of that was, um, the U S model, the GFS was going much colder and the European yeah. was not going as cold as all at, at all. So you had to go kind of like a blend. And if you look back, the European model was like 10 degrees too warm. And the GFS was like 10 degrees too cold. Yeah. And you had to go saying minus 24 on the right. GFS. Right. Now, Hey, this morning we had temperatures of 15 to 18 below across Northwestern areas of Illinois. I mean, that, that's pretty cold stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, was oh, it yeah. minus 24? No, but the GFS has always been too cold and the European has always been too warm. So you have to kind of try to find a balance. It's almost like looking at political polls. Um, you know which polls overdo it and which polls underdo it. And then you kind of try to find somewhat mm -hmm. of, a, of a, a midpoint yeah. there. And one of the things that, that I do when I look long range is I never just look at the Midwest or even North America. I look literally at the Northern Hemisphere and you can almost see the way the pattern is wanting to move from one part of the globe to another. The question still remains though, how cold we're gonna get next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The European is still kind of backing off a little bit, but man, you look at the area of cold and you look at the area of snow and you look at the GFS, which is the, Euro the US model, and it takes a dump of cold air, a lobe, a lobe of cold air, and brings it even further south and longer um, than this past one. And we could see, I mean, I took the dog for a walk this morning. I didn't think it was that cold. I had a coat on, I had my hat and gloves on. He probably thought it was cold because he lifted his legs a couple of times, you know, <laughs> when he was, yeah. was getting you know, filled with snow. But we were out there for 10 minutes, all right, it was five below. The wind was blowing at about five miles per hour, but it wasn't that bad. I felt And the worse. sun's out. And the sun's out, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like you were like squinting with the snow hitting your eyes. Um, when it gets to 15 below at a 20 mile an hour wind, I'll probably feel a little bit differently, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can see around here next week. But it's interesting to note, Mike and Peg, um, if we continue on this trend through next Monday or Tuesday, this will be the longest stretch of cold that we've seen around here since like 1954, which is really wow. quite amazing. Yeah. Wow. Which is really quite amazing that, that we haven't seen cold anywhere even close to this all winter, and then all of a sudden the hammer drops. Yeah. So what's it going to take to get that block to move so that this you gets out of here? That, that's a really good question because if you think about it, once the East Coast storm slowed down, that's when we got cold. Because what happened is that mm -hmm. entire block – over the East Coast, took the Greenland block, pushed it further west, and took whatever was coming over the poles and, and allowed it to slide southward. It depends really on what happens over the Northeast. Now, they got another snowstorm going through there today, another mm -hmm. six to 10 inches, which is really amazing considering this is their third big snow of the year, the first one they had in December, wow. but that one melted. That melted before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So the second one that just came through, you know, last week with 20 to 30 inches of snow, if you look at the, the temperatures of the Gulf Stream, and that's what I look at, I show my students this, there were a couple of buoys east of Virginia, about 1,000 miles east and about 500, northwest, 500 miles northwest of Bermuda. What, weather buoys. Uh, yeah, yeah, weather buoys. Um, the, the water temperature was literally in the low 60s. The Gulf Stream wow. is running around four to five degrees warmer than normal. And this is directly related to warmer than normal ocean temperatures and how when these systems grab on to that atmospheric river of moisture, kind of like what happened in California, 
you can get copious amounts of snow because there's more moisture in the atmosphere. So again, I mean, I don't wanna make every storm related to climate change, but one of the things that we have seen is when you get these persistent patterns, you either get really wet if it's during the springtime or in the wintertime, you get really white, you get huge amounts of snow. Mm. And we're, continu we're continuing to see more and more of that. But it seems like here in the Midwest, and I'll jump off this discussion in a second, is our winters are, are becoming more and more compact when it gets cold. And when it does get cold, it gets seriously cold. Wow. And, and, yeah, and I, later. And later. Yeah, that's a good point, too. We don't see these, you know, late December, or I shouldn't say not late December. We don't see these mid-December cold outbreaks anymore. Late December is a little bit different. But you see that, that, that cold plunge in middle to late October due to a highly amplified pattern due to tropical storms and typhoons. And then you see these highly amplified patterns um, during the mid to late winter when you start to see these enormous storms literally stall and then it allows the cold to basically dump southward. What has not been talked about, there has been a persistent area of extremely cold weather over eastern Siberia um, and northern Japan and South Korea for literally the last two months. And that has finally got dislodged and now it's moved across the poles into our area. But if you look globally, and now, it. and now we have it, and it looks like what we have is a smaller piece of it. The question is whether or not it comes back next week, and it looks like it might. All right. The good news, mm. believe yes. that, the good news is that three weeks from now, uh, we're looking at March 1st, right? <laughs> but yeah, but six, if it's, six weeks till spring. If it's, if it's six degrees, it's not going to be a good March 1st. Uh, all right, two things. First of all, um, uh, congratulations to you. You got a shout-out on AccuWeather. Uh, thanks for sending. Uh, there was a video where one of the meteorologists said you were his mentor and helped yeah. um, him understand. You guys worked together on some paper or something, and it was so cool to see the video. I tried to get a download. I couldn't figure out how to download it, so I didn't uh, show it here. It's, uh, it's on the Facebook page for the show, though. Yeah. Yeah, real, real, real quickly, I was probably in my fourth year at United Airlines, and the boss puts a, a note out saying, Stevenson High School is looking for someone to mentor kids who are interested in weather. And I went, I'll do it. So the kid would drive him. And he, was a, he was a senior, Kevin Cosgren. He was at Stevenson High School. And he would come in and city, watch me do my work. And then I would ask him questions. And you know, it's a lot of work when you're doing your work and you're trying to help someone else. It, it's it's you know, time consuming. And so we ended up doing a paper on, on comparing thunderstorms in the Midwest to the Northeast because he's originally from northern New Jersey. And it worked. We, we worked together really well for about two months, and he was really into it. So as soon as I saw someone into it, I went right with him. Um, he ended up wanting to know what he should do. He ended up going to the University of Notre Dame, um, got a degree in math, and then went to Wisconsin and got a master's in meteorology, went into the weather service, didn't like it, ended up going in the TV. Um, and <laughs> he's been doing it. I know, ever, I know I, I'm like, you're too smart for TV. Um, but, but, but that's what he wants. And you know, what's, you, know, you know what was best about that, Mike and Peg? Yeah. Was for years, I was getting Christmas cards, not from him, but from his parents. Thank you ah. every year. Thank you every year. And that to, me is, that to me is worth everything at that point. So. All right. And, and we have just really fast, I'm going to do a quick, really quick rant. Uh, and I'm going to show you this. This is something that Skilling had up uh, the other day, and it kind of made me upset because he he mixed things. On the left, you see the actual high temperatures. On the right, you see the wind chill, and he put them in the same graphic. So you know people are going to go, hey, well, Skilling said it was going to be minus 18 on Sunday, but it was only minus 6. What happened? Um, and it just it just annoys me when they – conflate the the actual temperatures with wind chill and this is why people will probably come to you and say well skilling said it was going to be minus 18 and you have to then explain what he was talking about that. yeah i'm beyond that that's fine <laughs> and i don't know if you can to be fair to tom i don't know if he did those graphics or somebody else does those graphics. yeah but he, right. but he showed him at least two different 
casts, four casts. So, mm-hmm. you know, if he if he had a chance, he could have. That's just me. That's just me. All right. Give us a four cast. Real, 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 real quickly, right now you have, you know, cable stations like CNN and Fox News complaining about what each other do. The day that weathermen start to complain about what each other do in <laughs> on a storm is the end of the We're world. We're done for. We don't, we don't do that because we always know that Mother Nature always has the last word. So, All right. Speak have, it. And, that, and that's the real science up there. All right. right? G- give us a forecast here. All right. So <laughs> high of 5 to 10 today. Um, snow tomorrow. We'll get a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, maybe one to two inches. But that's, as you know, when you get snow this, with this type of pattern, it warms things up. So 15 to 18 for high tomorrow, but then another surge of Arctic air Tuesday morning. So back to about 10 to 15 below Tuesday morning. Wednesday, Thursday, back into like single digits to teens. And then the real plunge comes next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Wow. That's record-breaking stuff. And on top of that, we got a snow depth of about 15 inches around here. Great because everything that the water got in before – frozen solid so there's a real nice base of permafrost and everything that was planted last year is going to come up happy um in about a month and a half or so so this is what you want this is what you want this time of the year and we got it fantastic rick uh again congratulations on your shout out on accuweather that is so cool and congratulations again on being right um we keep telling people you're the best in the city so uh, and set set you've got the address for sending the scones (laughs) (laughs) this this is this is all that's left right now okay (laughs) i know you ate him during the segment so uh Uh, and and, and there he is and jack gets the crumbs (laughs) (laughs) and and then he'll look at me and go is there any more so all right have a great you know with the dog it's like what what what, isn't there anything more coming right yeah what that's it well well when when, as soon as we like as soon as we get off, I get to finish my PB and J, which I've taken exactly one bite out of. So there, there we go. Yeah, I, I hear you. When I do Zoom sessions, I got to eat before I get started because it's tough to eat. And talk <laughs> <about>. <laughs> All right, Rick, have a great week. We'll talk to you next time. Sounds good. Thanks, All right. Rick. All right. Uh, all right, we're running. That was actually a little bit of a bonus time. So, uh, mm-hmm. uh, wow, we ran over by a couple of minutes. Want to thank everybody on the show, Skeet. Uh, man, that was fun uh, talking to Skeet. It was fun talking to Mitch Vestal, of course, uh, Rick DeMaio. I uh, want to thank Kathleen for her work. Uh, Basil was uh, the star of the show today. He was in fine form today, yes. Oh, my goodness. He was. He just uh, was having a great time. You, you didn't see how many times I hit mute my mic either. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. I was watching. You don't know how many times I hit your mute as well on this end. So there we go. Uh, I think that's it. Until next time, go green or go home. Uh, Stadler? Yeah, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much.